All right, who's ready for some extremely niche content? You're listening to the Jared Schoenig Big Band playing Whiteout, a composition by Jared that was arranged by none other than the great Jim McNeely for Jazz Big Band. If you don't know, the instrumentation of a big band is typically five saxophones, eight brass consisting of four trombones and four trumpets, and a rhythm section usually with piano, bass, and drums at least, and sometimes an additional guitar, percussion, or vibraphone or something. This past September, Jared Schoenig released a ridiculously ambitious recording project called Two Takes. The project consists of two discs of contrasting but related projects. The first disc being a quintet and the second disc, which I'm gonna focus on in this video, is sort of an all-star big band featuring eight of Jared's compositions arranged by eight different arrangers. Jared hired around like 40 collaborators for this project and a large number of those people are connections that Jared made while he was participating in the BMI Jazz Composers Workshop. Yeah, BMI was like a really amazing part of my early kind of life in New York. And you know, I I pride myself on my reading, so cats liked me, I did really great, and Jim McNeely and my caliber really liked me, and so they asked me to, you know, be in the band. Um, and I was in it for, I don't know, five years at least, four, five, six years, something like that. And he was really, very intense, you know, and uh, he played the crap out of everybody's charts, you know, and uh, I always thought he would take the, you know, just play bare chested, you know, like, like smashing pumpkins or something. But uh... <laughs> in this video, we're going to explore McNeely's arrangement of Jared's composition, Whiteout. As a former student of Jim McNeely's and a longtime fan of his music, I think Whiteout brilliantly encapsulates a lot of the major themes that have interested Jim throughout his career, including such diverse things as, for example, Balinese Kachak dance rituals and Ravel's orchestra illustration techniques. Whiteout is also a case study in how great arrangers utilize the rhythmic and harmonic materials found within a composition as fodder to expand upon in their arrangements. This is Score Study with me, Brian Kroc. Sometimes on a long plane ride, I would just write, work with rhythmic cells and develop them. Or I would, I would say, all right, five bars of seven, four, how many different ways can I combine that? Well, Let's see, five, that's 35, that's 78 notes, which is 10 groups of seven or seven groups of 10 or 20 groups of three and a half. This nerd part of me, uh, you know, the guy with the slide rule, <laughs> the high school would emerge. One of the defining characteristics of McNeely's writing, in my mind at least, is his focus on rhythmic ingenuity and playfulness. I'll never forget the first time I heard The Life of Riley, which Jim wrote for the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra to showcase the rhythmic genius of his bandmate, drummer John Riley. Since in this case, Jim was writing for another great drummer, Jared Schoenig, he seems to definitely have drawn from a similar bag in arranging Whiteout, a tune which begins with this off-kilter rhythmic ostinato. I, I wonder, did that rhythmic figure that starts on B2, you know, like as a listener, it sounds like a downbeat? And yeah. it's uh, when I saw the score, I was like, oh shit, this whole rhythm is actually different than I thought. This stemmed from kind of the idea of, you know, fives, groups of fives that I, like my buddy Ike Sturm, he, he was like messing around with fives a lot. So I would like walk around and like just practice singing fives over my feet. You know, I would walk at like 120. 130 something like that and like go you know down um, um, down 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 
dun, you know, and yeah. like, and that's how that tune came. Inevitably, since this is a drummer's project and composition, after all, there is a drum solo that begins in measure 266. Beginning on beat two, each hit is separated by the following durations in eighth notes. Five, six, five, five, eight, two, three, three, six, four, six, eleven. Try clapping or snapping on beats one and three while singing this ostinato. It's pretty damn tough. All right, why don't I give it a try? Here we go. <laughs> when measure 226 repeats, Jim adds a new interlocking rhythm. Upon closer inspection, you'll see that this rhythm is really just the same ostinato as before, but displaced by two beats to start on beat four. Played together, these two rhythms create an interesting composite. As is Jim McNeely's want, he explores this idea to its furthest extremes. So in measure 234, he repeats this process again by adding the same ostinato but displaced one more time so that it starts on beat one of the second measure of this eight bar group. Then when measure 234 is repeated, he does the same process again and displaces the ostinato one more time so it starts on beat three of measure two. So now we have four different iterations of the same rhythmic ostinato played simultaneously. As if to clarify the source of Jim's inspiration here, in measure 244, he asks the band to put their horns down and to chant the syllable chalk. Now, this part of the arrangement didn't make the final recording, but it is very revealing. Here, Jim is making explicit reference to the Kachak dance ritual from Bali, Indonesia. Kachak is a dance and music drama that was developed in the 1930s, telling the story of the Ramayana, an ancient Sanskrit text which is central to the Hindu religion. During these performances, dozens of people are separated into multiple different groups, each chanting their own rhythmic cell on the syllable chak. Well, the, uh, the inspiration for that was the, the Balinese chak, 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 chak. And, and um, well, one, one thing the Balinese do it's, it, in just about all their stuff is there's, uh, you know, rhythmic patterns that are interlocking. So with the kachak, maybe uh, chak, chak, kachak, chak, Kachak, chak, you might have that, and someone else is going to chuck it, and tuck it, tuck it, and tuck it, tuck it, and someone else is doing. I think there's five or six patterns, and you put them all together, and tuck it, 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 you know, it's like that, and um, it's all it's five or six different interlocking parts, and, and they do that in the, the, a lot of the, the gamelan music, um, all the figuration. Uh, it's, you know, three or four different rhythms that are interlocking. This is such a cool thing about arranging another artist's music to me. It's this sort of daisy chain of inspiration. Jared's inspiration in writing this rhythmically complex composition was playing around with rhythmic cells in groups of five. And that inspired Jim, in turn, to draw on his inspiration from Balinese Kachak music. And Jim's arrangement, in turn, inspired a really badass drum solo from Jared. But the, the fifths, uh, you know, that kind of thing I've used myself in, like, Absolution, the thing I wrote for Rich Perry and the Vanguard Orchestra and a number of yeah. other pieces. So, mm -hmm. and I'm certainly, uh, I'm not taking credit for inventing the perfect fifth. Um, <laughs> so the number five plays a very important role, not only in Whiteout's rhythms, but also in its harmony. Just as Jim took Jared's rhythmic scheme and pushed it to the extreme by layering it multiple times, he did the same thing with the perfect fifth power chords that open up the composition. Just listen to the eight bar intro. First, we hear just simple perfect fifths played in the low brass
bass and reeds, B flat and F. Upon repetition, we hear another fifth stacked on top of that. So B flat, F, C. And then finally, on the repetition of measure five, we hear another fifth stacked on top of that. So B flat, F, C, G. Then, in measure 9, a snaky chromatic melody is introduced that apparently was inspired by the improvisational style of trumpeter Shane Ensley from the band Kneebody. I wonder if Jim McNeely was inspired by the profusion of fifths in the intro when he decided to add parallel fifths above the melody line in the flute. There's sort of a beautiful connection in the perfect fifth thing that you did in the melody, which you described to me uh, as the Ravel Bolero uh, technique, where the there's a bunch of instruments in unison, and then you have a flute, a perfect fifth higher, which has a you know is a lot less weight, and as a listener, you almost don't even. You don't hear it. You sense. You don't it. hear it. It's, yeah, it's in there. Well, when Ravel did this. Uh... <laughs> So here's the melody, and then he's got A flat and E flat above it. And you can, he's using a two flutes and a piccolo to do that. So you're creating these artificial overtones. And you can use almost any combination of uh, of intervals up there. Uh, you know, you can do something with a. I'm doing a, a, a octave and a major seventh. And so you're creating this uh, little bit of disturbance up at the top of the overtone series. When I was a, a kid going to Catholic church at at the communion service. Uh, that's when the organ player, if it was a really good organist, they'd usually improvise some stuff. And they'd start to pull out some of the stops and they'd get these whacked out intervals going up and really very odd. <laughs> Yeah, I, I see it as just uh, you're being like a sonic alchemist. You're putting sounds up there that enhance certain overtones and create other overtones that aren't in the series of the basic instrument that's playing the thing. And so you're essentially you're creating an instrument that doesn't really exist except in the listener's ear. Going back to Ravel, you can't go into a music shop and buy an instrument that sounds that way, but you can make one using the different instruments of an orchestra. Being a sonic alchemist. You don't have to write music for jazz big bands in order to be inspired and influenced by Jim McNeely's brilliant arrangements. What I took away from studying with Jim for a couple years was to practice using my imagination, to constantly push my ideas further, and to make myself laugh by the absurdity and ridiculousness uh, that music can express. Yeah, it, it, without the imagination, and then it's just all kind of crud, you know? I mean, um, it's, you know, the image we have of the composer or arranger is somebody at the piano and they're, you know, playing a chord and, yeah, that's it there. And I write that. And, oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Play a chord about 1,500 times. And really, hear it and you write it down. That's part of it. But there's another part, which is just sitting back in a chair and, uh, thinking or hearing you know just hear just let your mind wander when i'm really distracted all of a sudden the sound comes to me now if what you heard in this video inspired you don't stop here jared schoenig's two takes project has been so informative for me because you get to listen to eight different arrangers interpretations of jared's compositions back to back. Each of these arrangers has a different perspective and brings a different set of influences to the music. So while Jim was thinking of 
Balinese dance rituals, for example, Darcy James Argue was thinking about alt-rock. Full disclosure, I contributed an arrangement to this project as well, and you can hear that performance by clicking the link provided in the description below. For my part, I was inspired by having the chance to write music for the people in Jared's insanely stacked band. So I was thinking to myself, what would I like to hear Donnie McCaslin soloing over? What crazy woodwind double would I like to ask Charles Pillow to bring to the session? What interesting guitar parts could I write for Near Felder? So no matter what kind of music you create or what tools you might use, you can learn so much from studying the great arrangers like Jim McNeely. I've got a cat on my lap here, but go on. <laughs> Wait, we need to yep. see the cat. That'll that'll increase uh, the he, <laughs> that'll late. only feed his ego. He'll <laughs> he knows he's on YouTube or something.